Let me see. Okay, I'm on right now. So work with If you would, let's remain standing together. Our Father, we come to you today and thank you for the privilege that we have to gather here to welcome each other and now, above all, to welcome you. So we come here in your name to lift up the name of Jesus. And so we pray that the Spirit of God would move in and among us today enabling us in our worship, that it would be from our hearts, that we would participate, that we'd see you and who you are. So God, may you be pleased in this time of worship today in the name of Jesus. And everyone said together, amen. We would like for you to join with us in a unison reading of scripture from the Old Testament to encourage us to sing and to worship the Lord together. So let's read it together. The words are provided for you there on the screen. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every Thank you. 
sing it together. Alleluia. Stand together, Lord, we praise you. 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 Our Father, we come to you today and we do lift up our voices, our hearts, our abilities, our possessions, our challenges. We offer them up to you today. And we want to be people that worship you, yes, in spirit and in truth. We acknowledge that you are God and that we are not, that you are sovereign and holy and righteous and right in all of your ways. And we bless you today. Thank you for the occasion of being able to come together with brothers and sisters and like-minded people to praise the name of the Lord. You know the things that are on our hearts today. The things that we are afraid of. The things that we might be overwhelmed with. But we pray today that we might have strength your strength and that we might be living testimonies of the faithfulness of God. We pray now that you would bless again continually the rest of this service for your name's sake. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, Amen. God bless you and you may be seated. Some important announcements this morning here in the life of our church, as you notice. Uh, this is an unusual setting here in our building as you entered into it. Uh, it is already prepared for tonight's kickoff ministry of our vacation Bible school. And uh, we just want you to be aware of it, your kids to be a part of it, your grandkids. And it starts tonight at 5.30 and ends at 8.30. It goes through Monday through, I mean, Sunday through Thursday. And then this coming Friday is a special time for us with the families and with the kids that will be coming uh, to our VBS to uh, have a time of fellowship and food and games and such here in our property and outside. So let me encourage you as our church family. Remember, our mission is to win people to Christ, to make disciples, uh, to bring people into a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ. So don't look at the person next to you and think, hmm, I'll just let them come Friday night. Nonsense. We need each of you to come. It's terrible to have a house full of company and then the host don't really show up. 
So you coming, extending a, a welcome, a smile, a getting to know people is very crucial for people to feel and accepted and to have the opportunity to be able to come back. So let me encourage you to be here this coming Friday night which will be also from 5.30 to 8 o'clock here. Hot dogs, water slides, petting zoo, volleyball, the whole nine yards. It's going to be a great time for us to be uh, together. So keep that in mind. Also, this Tuesday, the Joy Group is meeting, but they're going to be meeting away from the building because of it being set up for BBS. They're going to meet at Perkins uh, here in Jefferson City, just right up here off of the, um, is it Jefferson Street, I think is what it's called. Okay, and they're gonna meet at 11.30, and so those of you that would like to go out for a meal and have fellowship with the Joy Group, it's 11.30 this coming Tuesday at Perkins there at that restaurant. Also, men. Just be aware that our men's Sunday school class is going to host a men's barbecue and movie for us as men and teenagers. And so uh, let me keep uh, that before you. It's going to be on August the 6th at 4.30. That's a Saturday afternoon. Uh, let me encourage you to invite men, maybe from work or from your neighborhood, that might uh, enjoy a good time of fellowship with other men and have a good time of good food with barbecue. And then we're gonna come in and we're gonna watch a film together here to help us uh, be authentic men of God, to be husbands and to be fathers. So men, that's gonna be on August the 6th. So please keep that in mind as well. Also, don't forget to pick up your, Jan your July prayer guide for the month of July. We believe in prayer, and we have this here for you to pray daily for various people and various needs. Of course, this week we're going to be praying for a VBS, and so we want to just continue to lift up people in our community and our ministry in prayer. Speaking of prayer, I would like to have a special dedication prayer for all of the people that are going to be involved in VBS. And I want to also just say publicly a special thank you to Amanda Miller and also Amanda Yoder who have put this together. Where is Amanda? I know Amanda Miller. Oh, right there. Would you two ladies stand? And then they've had lots of helpers. So all of you that are involved in Vacation Bible School, whether it's snacks, teaching, tech, uh, whether it's you, you've come and worked on the building with all kinds of decorations and stuff, would you come forward here and just stand right across um, the uh, front here of the sanctuary? Remember, folks, people are not saved because of crafts. They're not saved because of snacks. They're saved because of the working of God's Spirit through the lives of men and women and young people. So we want to dedicate this uh, phenomenal team that God has put together. Why don't you guys uh, face the congregation? And you can see them. Most of you know almost all of them that you can pray for and lift them up. But can we thank God for these workers today? Would you agree with me here in prayer? Father, thank you so much for the ministry of Vacation Bible School. Many hearts have been won. Even the chairman of our governance board was drastically changed because he went to a VBS as a young boy. We want to thank you, God, for these men and women and young people that have set aside time out of a busy schedule and other demands in their lives to put first the mission of this congregation, and that is to minister to souls, and particularly this week on children. And we pray, God, that the message of the gospel, the message that we are valuable in your sight because we are made in the image of God, that human life is valuable because the image of God is stamped across to every human being. We pray that this God will penetrate into the lives of young boys and girls. We pray for them. We, we thank you for this amazing um, registration already of over 40 kids, and we're expecting even more to come tonight that have not registered. But we want to pray for this team 
Give them an anointing. Give them wisdom. Give them clarity. Uh, give them strength. Help them with all the other duties from work to housework to taking care of their families to getting meals provided in their own life and getting here at 515 every night this week. We want to pray a special blessing. And we dedicate them and this week of ministry for the glory of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's thank God for them again as they find their way back to their seats. I think we might have a video to show in regard to... G'day, mates. Welcome to Zoomerang. As we zoom around Australia, we'll discover some amazing animals and sights. More importantly, like a boomerang, we are returning kids to what the Bible says about the value of life. We'll discover how precious each and every one of us is to God, from the tiniest to the oldest. Each person is made in the image of God, wonderfully designed to know Him and to live for Him. Out of His great love, God offers us salvation through His Son, Jesus. Kids will learn that life is valuable. Grab your sunnies, that's your sunglasses and your mates, those are your friends, and get ready for a fair dinkum time at Zoomerang.
they would like to join me upstage. <laughs> Michael's a kid and you all know it. Um, there were four of us took eight, are you all here? Who am I? I'm not missing anybody, right? Hey, Lauren. Um, we all took off last Tuesday to San Antonio. Um, I had a wonderful time at IYC. Um, a lot of the photos are us doing bonding things together because that's, that's the best part. Not, I'm sorry, the, the preachers are the best part, but when they, when they build the relationships with each other, as I always, I always teach them, the big thing I drill into our youth is, and Atoma youth means unbreakable. The Atoma youth is Greek for unbreakable, indivisible. We want them to be indivisible or unbreakable in each other. They should lean on each other and be each other's support team. And so that's why these bonding things, Yes, it's wonderful to go and hear the speakers and learn about being Christ-like and following Christ, but having them bond together and grow together is, like, amazing for me. Anyway, I'm not supposed to talk the whole time, but this is Hosanna Wong. It froze on her. She, we opened with her. We had Jeremy Dixon. I really enjoyed him. Um, Chip Taylor, and I forgot the last, uh, Adam Rentis. Um, those were the... Adam Rentis is the... John Michael Hinton was a magician who was our master ceremonies. He was fun. We had him in Indiana, Indianapolis. Um, but we've asked the kids to do a little, make a little statement or say something about their experience. So here you go. I guess I'm going first. Um, so Hosanna was my favorite because I connected the most with her. So her sermon was on giving us new names because we all get ourselves names like bad names like ugly, stuff like that, and she says that our names don't define us and how we God give, has given us names, like my word was chosen, and then there was God's, I'm a child of God, and then stuff like that, and that's what mostly connected with me, but there's something fun that we did, when we went zip lining, someone decided to fall in the air and has a battle scar in front of us. <laughs> Not the only time she fall, fell during the trip. One thing that impacted me probably the most was just seeing all the other kids um, our age just worshiping and praying together, and that was just a really good experience for me. Um, my favorite part was getting to like be with all of these, like the youth, because we've gotten the opportunity to grow up together. We've traveled the world together. We've seen Indianapolis and so many cities in Missouri. And so as we've all like gotten to grow up and mature and become our own individual people, it was nice to get to see like Connor came out of his shell a little bit. And for the first time in the eight years or whatever, we've been in a youth group together. We've gotten to like I don't know, become a little family. And so it's nice to see that in a different environment other than just home church. Okay, so my favorite part was probably how the preachers like put their messages together, like back to back. I thought that was, it wasn't intentional, but it seemed that way. And I thought that was really cool how they, like how one reflected out the other one in the same days. I thought that was pretty cool. So what I really enjoyed, I'm just going to steal what Molly said, I enjoyed seeing just all these kids that were pretty much all our age, but still loved God and were all worshiping together in uh, one place. Um, I think the thing that probably impacted me the most was we spent the whole week together, so obviously everybody had their ups and downs emotionally, and I think that just seeing everybody being there for each other was the most like cool to see and like impactful overall. Okay, so my, honestly, I thought was the coolest thing is that we did this walk outside. So just imagine 2,000 kids walking in a straight line pretty much with each other. And yeah, in silence, all the way in downtown San Antonio. And everybody was looking at us and they're like, what's going on? Because they, they're, they're, they're trying to get through, they're just going through their normal actions and they see us and they're like it starts up there and they're like we, we see them and they lean back and they're like where's it in 
It's, it's funny, and then at the end, we went and worshiped outside, and it was, it was amazing. It was just, you could really tell God was there. So I'd like to say something about this guy right here. This guy, he stayed with the boys through the entire Go Ape course. Oh, you stayed with me. No, you stayed with us. And he did amazing, even for being injured. Very he impressive. Was, he, he's not old. Don't call him old. He did amazing. And I just like to say that, Rick, you're amazing. Well, I would like to thank the boys for keeping up with me. Because I, <laughs> I didn't think they could do it, but they did it. But uh, no, I, I really enjoy it. It's refreshing uh, to see that many kids. And then uh, I would like the church to know that, that our kids are, they're wonderful. It's a reflection of the parents, the church, our community. Um, uh, we got some great kids. And as the church says, upgrade. Uh, I think our church is a good reflection and that there, there, there's hope in the future because uh, our kids are special and they will upgrade and do good things in the future. By the way, we did finish the course like 45 minutes before the girls with Rick, so. Whatever. I was in <laughs> And you had a panic attack. <laughs> she did good, though. She did awesome. Anybody, fell out of the car. In the street. In the Praise oncoming God, traffic. She did not get hit. We were just so glad that there was some traffic coming through. <laughs> anyway, um, as Rick mentioned, the theme was Upgrade. It was really all about these kids being the next generation, coming up, taking their place, because that's what we're looking for, this new generation to come in and, and give worship and praise to God and lead others to, to him. And so that was really the focus of, of the whole session. As um, Kwasai mentioned, it was... I guess my biggest thing is just the presence of God being there the whole time, and you saw it in different ways. Um, Cameron and I had, had a conversation. We were talking about God showing up, God being present. How do we know he's there? And I started seeing it as I looked for it throughout the whole week that we were there. One being when, when Kwasai said something about the first speaker was talking about um, David and Goliath, and the second speaker had not even talked to the first speaker about what they were talking about. They also talked about David and Goliath. And so the, and the big thing was, is we just came back from NYF and the theme was identity. What did we talk about here? It was about upgrade, but it was about where your identity is in Christ. So there was just all these little things that kept happening. We went on the silent prayer walk. There was a rainbow in the sky. That was awesome. You know, it was just signs of God throughout the week and protection. <laughs> Christina fell out of the car. Thank goodness there was no car. Cars coming through. I mean, seriously, it was, it was kind of scary because we were like, in downtown San Antonio, and traffic was just flying by, and at the time she fell out, there was no one there, thank goodness. So anyway, um, but just things like that, just throughout the week, show up, we, we saw a lot of homeless people. Um, we were able to reach out to some of them. Connor had experience with that. He won't talk about it now, but if you want to know about it, he did. He saw a gentleman that spoke to his heart in McDonald's, um, did get the opportunity to speak to him, and uh, we ended up going to the river walk the next day and saw the gentleman again. That's God. <laughs> so he got the opportunity to speak to the gentleman. So anyway, that's all I wanted to share, and I, it sounds like Michael's waiting for me to stop. <laughs> No, I'll, I'll be real quick. Uh, one, one thing that, you know, we had a lot of good times and, and things went well, but, but the youth also got to see that, you know, we, we all struggle. So um, the fact that, uh, that, you know, we're not, we're not all perfect. We, we still have flaws and things that we, we need to work on. Um, you know, even, even spending time with God, you know, we, we, we fall short on that sometimes. So I thought that was something that, we could share as a group that, you know, we're not, <clears throat> we're not perfect, you know, we, we, we still have work to do, so that's all. And when it's all said done, we still love each other. Even me and Michael. Yeah. 
I, this is, I know I'm making fun and I'm kind of jesting here, but we, they crack jokes quite a bit. They're, Michael and I are truly, we're not blood brothers and sisters, we truly have a relationship like a brother and sister. I've grown, we both grew up here in this church. You know, I joined this church in 1979 when I was born. Um, okay, I pushed her out in the church. He did, no, no. <laughs> Okay, but, for confessions time, I pushed her in the street. But Sorry. him and I fight like brother and sister. We come back together as brother and sister. And when something's when I'm struggling or like I was really having a panic attack, we were in kind of a shady neighborhood, and I, and the, the, I was worried about the bags. And he's like, "Hey, no worries. Let's go get the bags. We brought everything in the, just to make me feel better." He was my big brother in that moment. But the next day, I wanted to kill him. And then they joke about, "No, no." It's just, they see that just like I want them to lean on each other. And now they joke. Olivia says that when she's my, when my age, she's going to be, her and Cameron are going to be me and Michael, Argan, my brother and sister. They have that, that the, warms my heart. So even though we argue about it, those, the, the fami familial relationships, brothers and sisters in God, that they are to each other, they even learned it from the two of us, fighting all the time. But anyway, all right. <laughs> we love you. Thank you guys for supporting us. Thank, thank you for all your support. It, we yes, appreciate it. Yes, thank Definitely you so do. much. While they're finding their way back, I especially appreciate Michael and Kim and Rick and Christina to give up their vacation time and travel all the way to San Antonio, Texas with eight of our young people. Can we just thank God for that in an amazing way? Today, before we actually have our sermon, by the way, children are going to be in here today. Judy needs to be anointed and prayed for. She's having some back pain. And um, so we want to lift her up and pray. If you believe in prayer, would you mind uh, just coming and we'll gather around and lift her up in prayer together. Judy, we anoint you in the name of the Lord. Our Father, we thank you so much for our sister Judy, that she's been bought by the blood of Jesus. And it is by the blood of Jesus that we are also healed. We believe in divine healing. We want to pray that, God, you would give her a touch. We do thank you. We also believe that you use doctors and such. Thank you for what they've been able to do. But, God, she needs a further touch. And we pray that through the Spirit of God, there would be a touch, alleviate her back pain, bring healing where there needs to be healing, give her much grace and strength through this whole process. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. There's a story of a little boy named Sam. And Sam's getting ready to have about his sixth birthday. And his mom says, we're going to have a birthday party for you. What would you like to do? Well, I would like to have hot dogs and ice cream. I would like to be able to go fishing with dad. And I would like to be able to have someone come and even spend the night for a sleepover. His mom said, that would be a great idea. You can have one person who you're going to invite over. I'm going to invite Jimmy, my best friend. So the next day at school, Sam approaches Jimmy and says, Jimmy, uh, I hope that you're available Friday night because I'm going to have a special birthday party for my sixth birthday, and I would like for you to come and even spend the night. Jimmy willingly accepts the invitation, which brings much joy and anticipation in the heart of Sam. But the next day, lo and behold, Jimmy is approached by Luke, another classmate, and says, and says Jimmy, I'm going to have a, a party at my house this coming Friday night. We're going to go to Chuck E. Cheese, and we're going to sleep out in tents, and the whole class is coming, and I would like for you to come. Jimmy, all of a sudden, is now between a rock and a hard place. He's already accepted the invitation to go to the birthday party for Sam. He says yes, 
because after all, he loves Chuck E. Cheese and he would love to sleep in the tent. What an exciting thing. The next day he tells Sam, I, I need to tell you, Sam, I'm not able to come to your birthday party Friday night. Sam says, why? Well, because Luke, he's invited me to come to his party. He's going to Chuck E. Cheese and they're even going to sleep outside in tents. By the time that Sam comes home that afternoon from school, he's in tears telling this whole thing to his mom. It's also beginning to bug Jimmy, who sits down and talks to his dad and says, Dad, I have a real problem. You see, I was invited to come to this birthday party for, for, for Sam, and I said yes. I mean, I, I agreed to it, but then there was a better offer that came along. Luke invited me, and I accepted, and I'm not sure what to do. The father said, well, I'll tell you what. If, if you go ahead and you go to the party for, for, for Luke and, and you've already agreed to go to the party for Sam, if you go to that, it would be like, you know, hey, listen, maybe I could get a different wife. You know, there's a lot of younger women at the office they're a lot more friendly at times than sometimes your mom might be. And so maybe I ought to get a different wife. Jimmy says immediately, well, Dad, you can't do that because you promised Mom. It's a powerful reminder to us that marriage is a promise that is to be lived out for one's life. Can the people of God say amen? From this counsel, from Jimmy's father, he went back to Luke and said, Luke, I'm sorry, I can't go to your party with Chuck E. Cheese and with sleeping out in the tents. I had already made a commitment, a promise, to go to Sam's birthday party. As you know, we're in this sermon series called The Perfect Ten, seeing God's love in the Ten Commandments. And today we're on the simple commandment, you shall not commit adultery. It's pretty plain in Scripture, and so today we're going to look at what that actually means for us to reflect this command, which reflects the nature and the character of God. And so we find out that a promise given is a promise to be kept. This command is about living in sexual purity, both in body, mind, and heart. For let me read the verse of Scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28, which Jesus expounds even further on this commandment found in the Old Testament. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we look to you today to give us instruction, to give us help, in order that we might live holy lives in every aspect. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus often referred to the generation at which he lived in here on earth as an adulterous generation, as an adulterous people. They evidently had some sexual views that were somewhat upside down and skewed. I don't know if you know it or not. I think you mostly do. We live in a very adulterous generation today. 
It's shocking to find out that America is the number one producer of pornography for the entire world. It's difficult for one with the media, with the tabloids, with television, and even with social media, to live a lifestyle of sexual purity and sexual purity in one's thoughts. I mean, I, I don't know if you know it or not, but we've just come through what is known as Gay Pride Month in June. I saw a report this week that was stunning to me, even by the secular media, at how this has become so perverted. And things I saw that you would just be shocked at that's done in broad daylight and labeled to be prideful. We live in an adulterous time. Well, if we're struggling in this area, nobody really needs to be told again, but rather we need to have some encouragement on how we can live differently by the grace and the power of God. So we're going to look at some things here that will help remind us, based even on other scripture, to live holy lives, especially in the area of our sexuality. First is this. We need to be reminded and understand that our sexuality is a gift, a good gift from God. We find in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, that God created them male and female. That this whole concept, in, in other words, have you ever thought about it, that God was actually the first one to actually have a sexual thought? He's the one that thought of it. He's the one that came up with it. And he created two sexes. Can the people of God say amen? amen. Male and female. They're compatible. They complement one another. And this is why the Bible says that, that, that a husband and a wife, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and they will become one flesh. The marriage bed should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. God's thoughts of sex was good, pure, holy, and right. And it's a gift to us. It is a gift to us. And it is very vital that we understand this because here I tell you what, some of us have a very negative view of sexuality. We get, I, I can just almost feel it in the room. You get a little squeamish. It's like, oh, now, Pastor Joe, are we really going to talk about this at church? Are you kidding me? It's talked about everywhere else. Surely we can talk among it in God's house. But some of us grow up with a, a view that sex is taboo, that it's not really good unless it's dirty, and, and, and we've got that kind of mindset. But that's not the mindset of God. God's view is that it is beautiful, holy, in his mind, done his way. And so we need to understand that our sexuality is a good gift from God. As I said earlier, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and they will become one flesh. This is, of course, from the book of Genesis, and Jesus even quoted this in the New Testament, that they would become one flesh, that a husband and wife will come together not only just in body, but in mind, heart, and will, that they become one that they become one in all aspects of their existence. Now, the union is put together and, as it is, and, and it begins to grow as it matures with both husband and wife, but there becomes troubles that happen in a marriage. For example, if the men only focus on being one with their wife physically, then there's troubles. He's not really interested in becoming one with her emotionally. He's not really into that. 
He's not really into, uh, you know, heart to heart and really being one in mind. He's not really interested. There, there can be some troubles in that. There can also be troubles, on the other hand, when, when the wife is only interested in really becoming one emotionally, but she wants to be disconnected physically. God has put this together both physically, mentally, spiritually, relationally, emotionally, and what God has put together, we should not separate. That marriage is for the, for the lifetime duration of the husband and of the wife. God has joined us together, and this is a good thing that God has created. Next, our sexuality in a fallen world. When sin entered into the picture, it tainted everything and everybody to our core, including our human sexuality, has been corrupted. Your thoughts, your intentions, your desires, your aim, I don't know if you understand it, but sin has corrupted every aspect of us. How do you deal with that? And what moves, how do we move forward with that? Now, we all may not struggle with the same struggles, but we at all one time struggle at some aspect in our sexuality. One struggle that can happen often is that sex is the means to just have a release or fulfillment rather than expressing marital love one to another. That somehow it's just for oneself. Sexual union is within a marriage covenant relationship for one man and for one woman. Can we say amen? Listen, I, you're going to call me old-fashioned, and this is not popular. Sex before marriage is still not the will of God, and it is still viewed as sin by Scripture. That's the truth. Sex is only to be expressed between one man and one woman in the covenant of relationship of marriage, period. Anything else of that is sin in the eyes of God. That's the Bible. And listen, my friend, we must stand true on the authority of the word of God, period. And so God has created this, and this is and, and one of the things that has plagued us is this cancer of pornography. It has taught men and women that it's all about my needs. It's all about me being fulfilled. It's all about what makes me feel good, and it is all pictured without any kind of love. We have gotten this wrong view of what God has given to us. Sex is not to be reduced to a way of gratification or self-indulgence, but rather an expression of love to one spouse. I love this, what Colin Smith has said, who is just, he's written this book that's really helped me in this. I want to give him credit and be just really true to this. He's written a book called Your Ten Greatest Struggles, and it all is about the Ten Commandments. This one, of course, has to do with purity. With purity. And he says this, God's good gift of sexual union within a marriage is abused when it is uh, uh, pursued without love and where it is withheld where there is love. Our sexuality in a fallen world. Now the good news is, Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, who came to earth, has redeemed even our sexuality. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, how many of you know he redeemed every aspect of our life? Not just, not just the fact of telling a lie or loving somebody, but it's every aspect of our lives Christ has come to redeem. He has come to redeem us and to live in a holy life in this present world. In other words, he didn't just come just to save us from the penalty of hell. He came that we might have life in this here and now and have it more abundantly. John 10.10, 10. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more 
abundantly. So Christ has come to redeem us and to redeem even our sexuality. God's will for us is to walk in purity. Would you look at this passage of Scripture? Brother Chris, I think I have it up here. First, yes, First Thessalonians verse four, verses, chapter 4, verse 3 through 8. It is God's will. How many of you have ever wondered what in the world is God's will? How many of you have ever wondered what God's will is? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. God, is it, my, is it your will for me to take this job? Is it your will for me to marry this person? Is it for your will for me to do this, to do that? Hey, listen, if you ever get confused about that, let me tell you, there are some things in Scripture that are very plain. This is very plain. This is the will of God for us. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this manner no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or a sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject human beings, but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. The will of God for us is to live sexually pure lives in thought and in action. Amen? Oh, there's a weak amen. The will of God is for us to live sexually pure lives in thought and in action. Can we say amen? amen? This is the will of God for us. And without it, without it, my friend, God will punish those. You know, I, I watched a, a video this week. I'm not sure if I'm going to show it to the church or not. I mentioned it to Brother Harold this week. And it's talked about the church in America. And I had never really thought about this. We have reduced the gospel down to three words. God is love. And sometimes it's switched. Love is God. But did you, and, and, and first of all, now I really hear a strong amen on this. Um, God is love. Amen? The Bible is very clear about this. But did you know that the love of God is not mentioned at all in the Gospel of Matthew? Did you know that it's not mentioned at all in the Gospel of Mark? Did you know that the love of God is not mentioned at all in the Gospel of Luke? Did you know that the love of God is mentioned once, primarily in the book of the Gospel of John? It's the most famous, what, verse, for God so loved the world. But why did God so love the world? so that people will not perish. The core of the gospel is this. What did Jesus say? <laughs> Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, the wrath of God is coming on all of man unless you repent. That's the gospel. You don't have good news unless you have bad news. The bad news is that we are all doomed for hell apart from God's grace in our life. That's the gospel. And God in his love has sent a remedy for our sin nature, for our sin plague, for our disobedience through his son who paid the ultimate price. We must accept that by faith or the wrath of God is coming. That's the gospel. And people today think they can get away with murder and God's okay with it. Because God loves me. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this is crucial. 
that we don't lull ourselves into sleep into some sort of false sense of security. The wrath of God is coming on those who do not believe. Why in the world do you think we're having vacation Bible school? Because we're bored? No, because people are lost without God and they need to hear the gospel. That's the truth. I'm sorry, I'm getting so fired up. But this is burning in my soul. This is what America needs. America needs the gospel. The Republicans are not going to preach the gospel. Neither are the Democrats. It's the church, you and I. It's our responsibility to share the gospel, to live out the gospel. That it changes people's lives and therefore changes their destiny. It's not coming to church. I'm thankful that Christina was born in here in 1979. I remember that year real well. But being born here physically doesn't make you right with God. Coming to church doesn't make you right with God. It is yielding yourself in repentance to a holy God. God have mercy on me. And so we must take this seriously. Amongst us as God's people, there should be, as Paul the Apostle said, there should not even be the hint of sexual immorality amongst you. He says that in Ephesians. Look what else he says here. i got to catch my breath. Look here what else he says on the next passage of Scripture, Brother Chris, which is 1 Corinthians, or, yes, 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. Flee. Did you understand that of all the temptations that you and I can face, sexual temptation is the only one that we're told to flee? Get out of there. If you think you can stand up to it, you are whistling Dixie. Move. The other temptations were, in, were commanded to stand firm, stand your ground. But sexual sin, flee from sexual immorality. All sins a person commits are outside of his body. But whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. It's pretty plain. Honor God with your bodies. Jesus has come to redeem every, every aspect from what I put on my taxes to what I let think in my mind. There's a story of a man who was sent to prison. He was sent to prison because he was caught, tried, and found guilty of being a thief. While he was in prison, he got gloriously saved because he heard the preaching of the gospel. And he repented and began to grow in his relationship with Jesus Christ. He abandoned the idea of ever stealing again. His release date finally came, and he was released from prison. He was extremely a little nervous about it. He thought, if I go back to my friends, the only people I know outside of the prison walls, they're all thieves. I can't do that. So what he does, the very first thing that he does is on that first Sunday, that first Lord's Day after he's been released, he comes to a local church like ours. He slips in the back row and he sits on the back, he slips in the back door and sits on the very back row. And to the side, he notices that lo and behold on the wall is the Ten Commandments listed. And the one that is staring him in the face is, thou shalt not steal. He all of a sudden feels guilty. 
overwhelmed. Shameful. And as he sat there, guess what happened? The beautiful ministry of the Holy Spirit began to move upon him. And the Spirit began to gently whisper to him, you shall not steal was first given to you as a commandment. Now, because of the blood of Jesus, and now because of the work that I'm doing in your heart, it is no longer a command. It is now a promise to you that you shall not steal anymore because of the work that God has done in your life. Can you imagine taking the commands of God and flipping them around and making them your promise? Can you? God, you have told me that I am not to commit adultery, even in my thought life. Wow! So I'm going to look to you, because listen, God, I'm, I'm hopeless without you. How many of you are like Pastor Joe? You're just hopeless. How many of you try to do all kinds of right things for God and you have failed? Is there anybody in the house? And I'm just going to shoot straight with you. I'm just as American, and I don't care if I am 62 years old. There was a day I was 22 years old. I'm just as hot-blooded as any other American man in this room. So listen, I'm not up here theorizing. I'm up here. I'm really talking. I'm really preaching to Pastor Joe, and I'm just letting you listen. But God's grace, listen, if we're going to sing about amazing grace, sure we're gonna, surely we're going to let it change us. As the scripture says, it is the grace of God, God's favor on Wayne's life, God's favor on Scott's life, God's favor on my life that will teach me to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. It's the grace of God. I just love, this is, my, this is one of my life's verses. It's found in Romans chapter 6, Paul's letter to, uh, uh, to uh, Rome. I'm, I, now this is all, this isn't even in the message, so I'm just giving you this. He, he says this, listen, sin, those besetting thoughts, those desires that are outside the will of God. He says, sin shall not be your master because you're no longer under the law, but under grace. So I have had to tell God, God, now remember, this is your promise to me. I, I, don't have to be, I don't have to be a slave. I don't have to give in. I don't have to look to this. I can, by your grace, live a holy life. You see, God's grace is sufficient for us. Amen? It is sufficient for us to live the life that God wants us to live. Jesus has redeemed our sexuality. It's amazing. And take the promises of God. I loved in the 1990s I love the, the, God, the movement that God did among men called Promise Keepers. And it really encouraged men to be aware of their promises to God, to their wives, and to their children. But can we take it much, much deeper than that? that I can't rely upon Joe to keep my promises. For one thing, my kids are always going to point out when I don't keep my promises but I can rely on God's promises. God's promises are, we, we sang it this morning, that we're standing on the promises of God. Stand on the promises of God's commands being then your promise to you. Lastly, the thing that we also need to work and avail ourselves to is growing in holiness. Growing in holiness. As we've said, sexual sins are what we are to flee from. But in order to grow in a life of holiness, there must be a couple things that you and I must cultivate. First of all, we must cultivate a living relationship 
with Jesus Christ. We must become intimate with Christ. You remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament? I'm named after Joseph. I don't know that I was a good-looking man like Joseph was. Remember, he was sold into slavery, into the house of Potiphar. And the Bible was very clear. He was very good-looking. And Potiphar's wife noticed him. In every way, shape, and form, from her speech to her demeanor, she was enticing him to come to bed with her. And do you remember his response? Do you remember what he said? He didn't say, hey, hey, you know what? Not today because we might get caught. He said, no, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? How could I do such a thing to God? I mean, how, how could I violate him? How could I wound his heart? How, how in the midst of everything that's gone on in my life, God has been good to me. How could I do this to him? You see, this is much more than just between Joseph and another woman. See, this is what happens with sexual sin and temptation. God seems far removed. You even forget about him. He's long gone. But not Joseph. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against the Lord? Joseph saw this as what it was. The power of temptation. First of all, we must understand, how many of you know we all are tempted? How many of you have been tempted even this week? Yeah. Some of you are living higher on a higher plane than me because some of you didn't raise your hand. You're living higher than Jesus because, remember, Jesus was tempted in all manner, yet was without sin. Temptations, you might as well accept it. They're going to come. They will come. You're not going to grow beyond the fact that you're never going to be tempted again. That is a fantasy. Praise God, our temptations will be over when we go home to be with the Lord. But while we are here, this is still a testing ground for us. We will be tempted. So if you think, well, I can handle this, you're crazier than a bed bug. If you think one, a second look at another woman or a second look at another man you can handle it. You're playing with fire. How many of you know that old saying, you give the devil an inch and what will he take? A mile. If you think that temptation is no big deal, you will fall every time. You will. But how many you know the promise of God? There is no temptation that has besieged you except that which is common to man. You're not the only one. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But with the temptation, provide a way of escape so that you can bear under it. Now that's either true or we might as well go home. That when you're tempted, you're actually being tempted to violate your relationship with God. So temptation, don't look at it very casually because it will eat your lunch every time. Cultivate a relationship with Christ that is intimate, that you begin to know him. I, 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 I ask this often, and, uh, and we might as well just be transparent. I think Brother Michael mentioned it today. How many of you struggle? Come on. How many of you struggle with having daily time with God. Man, 
Now, you're going to continue having that struggle. You're going to have to rely upon the grace of God and your own choices. See, you, when we work with God, we, we work with God's grace. Remember what the Apostle Paul said at the end of his life? I have fought. I have, done, I have fought the fight. I have kept the faith. There's things for us to do. So it's going to be difficult and challenging for you, but you must spend time with God. You've got to. Knowing God. I don't even have, here, knowing God and, and getting away with Him morning by morning or evening by evening, whatever is best for you, daily, spending time reading His Word. How are you going to know what the Bible says? Knowing His Word. Know, this is how you know His heart, how you know Him, His character, His purposes, as we found out in Sunday school, His activity through human history. It's in God's Word. How, 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 you're going to know Him through, your, through His Word, and then you're going to know Him through prayer. And I don't know if you know it or not, but prayer is hard. Work. Sometimes it's easy. It's really easy if you've had a good cup of coffee. I got up this morning. Oh, I woke up at, I don't know, 4 o'clock. And then I got up, and then I went back to bed. And every, every time that happens, I'm like in a coma when the alarm goes off. And so this morning that happened. I didn't want to get up. You couldn't hardly stir me with a stick. But no, I got to get up. And then you get up, and you've got fatigue, and you've got all kinds of things on you. Listen, prayer. Knowing God, anything that, even in your relationship with your wife and with your husband, you have to give time. You have to make an intentional decision, intentional avenue of spending time. If you never, ever hear anything I have ever said to you is this, spend time with God daily. Get along with him. Get along with him. And when you do that, you, you'll begin to realize you're growing in your faith, you're growing in your relationship, you're growing as this point is. You begin to grow in the holiness and in the character of God living out in your life. That does affect how you treat your wife. That does affect how you treat your, uh, your mom. That does affect how you treat your classmate. That does affect every aspect of your life. Cultivate your life. Next and lastly, we are to rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit. We are to take action. Can you say the word action? Oh, that was pitiful. Can you, that we need a little bit more action behind our action. Can you say the word action? Action. You've got to take some action on this. You can't be passive about this. Close your, I mean, fold your arms and say, now God, you go out. No, no, no. We've got to work with God. Look what this passage of scripture up here says to us from Romans 8. Put to death the misdeeds of the body. That's not God talking to himself. That's God talking to you, a bought blood child of God. If you're a Christian, we're to put the misdeeds of the body to death. We're to die to those things. We're to cooperate with God. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. God's even provided a spiritual armor. And let me tell you, men, I know this is not, he's not here today, they're on vacation. Danny, this is his heart for the men's Sunday school class and for the men's ministry. Listen, guys, I'm just going to shoot straight with you, men. You're not going to walk in sexual purity and thought unless you have other men with you. You will not do it alone. And our church, yes, the standard is God's word. Yet we will believe in God's word. It is our rule of faith. But let me tell you something. We also need to have enough love for one another that we can share in confidentiality our struggles and our burdens. Amen? See, I, I, I need Scott. I need other men to come alongside. And I need to have a brother, in a, I need to have a brother that I can talk to that I can say, hey, you know what? I'm struggling today. You see, Pastor Joe, you don't know this about your pastor, but I'm in a group 
of seven other pastors in this nation. We meet every Tuesday for two hours by Zoom. If I'm struggling, I just text them. I'm supposed to make three calls a week to, one, to, all, to any three of them. And they're supposed to make, we're all supposed to be calling. How can we pray for you? Here's what I'm struggling with. Here's what's going on in my thought life. Uh, are you kidding me? I'm not an island unto myself. We need the body of Christ in order to walk in victory. We need to be able to bear one another's words. And this is what I'm saying. Church, our fellowship, needs to be a safe place that we can share and know that someone will have our back in prayer and in support. We need one another. Satan's lies, don't believe them, but believe the truth. And lastly, when you, when you look at this commandment and even this promise, you shall not commit adultery. There's some of you in here whose spouse committed adultery. How do you move forward? How do you forgive someone that violated a promise, a trust to you? How do you move forward in that? How many of you move forward if you've been sexually abused? How do you do that? Healing does not always come easy. But forgiveness is biblical and it is holy and right. How many of you understand that with our human capacity, working alongside of God's grace, that oftentimes forgiveness comes in stages. Step by step. Sometimes it's a big step. Sometimes it's a tiny step. Sometimes if the person is still living and they're still doing whatever they might want to do that's hurting you, sometimes it's a little bit of a step maybe backwards. But then God always moves upon you to work. We must even forgive those who committed a sexual sin even against us. Remember, God's grace will enable you. And remember, it is vital for us to forgive those who have trespassed against us. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the gift of our sexuality. Wow, what an amazing gift you've given to us, both men and women, both male and female. Thank you for the gift of marriage, the gift of husband, the gift of a wife, the gift of how we get to reflect who you are, even in the marriage covenant. Thank you for creating our sexuality and sex itself. Thank you that like everything else that has come from your mind and your hand and your heart, it is pure holy and right. I also pray today, this really is for all of us, that you would forgive us for areas where we have abused it, misused it, had wrong views of it, where we've let the world shape our understanding or even some of our dysfunctionality from our, from our family of origin had a shape. We pray that our, our view of this amazing gift will be reshaped, reclaimed because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. 
Help us as the people of God that we will live holy and pure lives with integrity with one another and with people outside of these walls. Help us to take every thought captive to be obedient to the Lordship of Christ. Help us also that we might forgive those who have violated this commandment or our sexuality. Help us somehow by your amazing grace to forgive those that have hurt us in deep, deep ways. And we pray that in the midst of an adulterous generation, we might have marriages that reflect the relationship that Jesus has with the church. That we might have young people, singles, that live pure lives and live accordance not to the whim of the time, but to the will of God found in Scripture. If there was ever a day that we needed to see this role modeled out, it is now. You're calling us. You're equipping us to be those very men and women. And we thank you for that. In the name of Jesus. And everyone sit together. Amen. I think we might just sing one verse of a